All right. Hi, everyone. All right, um, we're going to get started here. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for logging in uh, today. Um, we have a really uh, special event today. Uh, my name is Jason Oliver Chang. I am the uh, uh, director of the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. I'm also a professor in the history department, jointly appointed with the institute. Um, this is a uh, a very special event here at UConn. Uh, the annual uh, Day of Remembrance, uh, which started in 1978 uh, around the Japanese American incarceration, um, has been a part of UConn since it, the, the founding of the Institute, thanks to the founder, uh, founding director, Roger Buckley, uh, who introduced this, uh, this as a, a central intellectual feature of, of both the curriculum of the Institute as well as its programming. And, um, and so a course on Japanese Americans during World War II has been a part of the curriculum here since the 1990s and, um, and has animated this, uh, this important event. Uh, and so, you know, because of you know, the, how central this has been to the Institute, we were incredibly excited of, uh, about bringing on a new faculty member uh, this year, uh, Professor Hana Maruyama, uh, who is, um, is our, our, our newest addition to the Institute, uh, jointly appointed also with history. Uh, so, in, and her work is, is centrally concerned, not only with the Japanese American experience, but how it's impacted, you know, so many different dimensions of American power uh, as it's expressed in white supremacy, settler colonialism, um, and many other facets. And so we're, I'm incredibly proud to have her as part of our team and, um, and that she's leading this um, this this incredible event today. So uh, before before we get started, I want to share my screen just to thank a couple of our uh, co-sponsors and um, and then share an offering of uh, solidarity. Uh, so this is um, I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, we're just going to leave it at this. Um, so uh, we have a, a very you know, rich cast of co-sponsors for this event. Um, you know, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, uh, the CLAS Dean's Office, UConn, uh, UConn's History Department, the Sustainable Global Cities Initiative in Hartford, uh, our Africana Studies Institute, El Instituto, the Asian American Cultural Center, and the Native American Indigenous Studies Program. And I also wanted to share this piece of art that, uh, that I've made as, um, as, you know, that was inspired by uh, the, last, uh, the last time that we did the Day of Remembrance event here at UConn um, with Brandon Shimoda. And, uh, and in this image, I've combined aerial views of Camp Amache in Southeast Colorado and the Tornillo Tent City in West Texas. Camp Amache or the Granada War Relocation Center held more than 7,000 Japanese Americans from 1942 to 1945. During that period, 107 people died at the camp, all of whom were children. The Tornillo Influx facility detained more than 4,000 Mexican and Central American minors from June 2018 to January 2019. Over the eight months in which the tent camp operated, seven children died in custody. The white painted X's over the pencil sketches of the Camp Amache barracks mark the national amnesia of Japanese American incarceration. And this cultural and political condition makes the Tornillo Influx Center possible. This, the, the brightly painted Tornillo tents refer to the presence of children there. Uh, the juxtaposition of the playful circus colors and the tents against the horrific conditions of US immigration policies of family separation and indefinite detention indefinite child detention demand a recognition of the torment, cruelty, and violence done to vulnerable youth in the name of US national security. So with this you know, artistic offering uh, in, in view of, of this program uh, inspired by history, uh, I turn it over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much for 
for this. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, that was so lovely. I love that piece of art. Um, and what a wonderful program. So I want to just say thank you so much for joining us for um, this presentation and to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the signing of Executive Order 9066. Order 9066 enabled the forced removal and incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans, as well as uh, Japanese Peruvians and Japanese Panamanians during World War II. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pagusset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land through the, throughout the generations and continue to steward it today. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. We recognize that a land acknowledgement is just the beginning of our responsibilities to indigenous people as a land grant institution. And we have an ongoing commitment to helping indigenous people today to assert their sovereignty, protect their land and support their communities and nations. This is an important thing for us to say as Asian Americans who are not indigenous to this land. Um, and I think it's actually crucial to our, and I'm sorry if you are hearing a, um, a siren outside right now, this is the nature of working on Zoom. Um, but uh, before I was interrupted by a siren, um, I just wanna say um, this is crucial to recognizing Day of Remembrance. Everything that happens here is happening on native land. And so um, starting off with this um, land acknowledgement is a, an important part of how we advance um, the present day issues that enmesh us all. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to tell us a little bit about how they came to the work that they do today and um, about a little bit about that work. So we're gonna start off with Mike Ishii. Um, and Mike is a Yonsei performing artist, organizer and clinician in, the New in New York City. He is the co-leader co and co-founder of To Do For Solidarity and has been the co-chair of the New York Day of Remembrance Committee for 30 years. He is the chair of the New York Japanese American Oral History Project, which received a 2018 Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant, and he is a former president of the Japanese American Citizens League New York chapter. Ishii also serves as a volunteer for the Tule Lake Pilgrimage Committee and sits on the board for the Hudson Valley Park for study and re reflection. He has written and performed spoken word and performance art pieces related to his family's incarceration in the WRA camp or war relocation camp, um, Minidoka, exploring themes of remembrance and healing from intergenerational trauma. He studied classical music at Oberlin Conservatory and Juilliard School, performing extensively as a French hornist with the New York City Orchestra and chamber ensembles for 20 years before moving to a career in East Asian medicine. Um, Michael was also the clinical chair for the University of Bridgeport Acupuncture Institute and now practices privately in New York City. And he is currently also a PhD candidate studying traditional Chinese medicine with a focus on the ability of five phase nodal sounds to affect blood pressure in humans. So without further ado, Mike. Thank you, Hannah. Oh my goodness, that was, that was uh, too much of my bio, <laughs> but... Um, Thank you for this invitation. It's really um, a privilege and honor to be here with everyone today. I want to thank um, Jason and Hannah for this uh, invitation. And um, yeah, as Hannah mentioned, I used to work at the University of Bridgeport, so it's really nice to circle back with friends from Connecticut. Um, well, so Hannah asked me to speak a little bit about how I came to the work. and. I, I think I need to say that I come to this work primarily through my family um, historical connections. My mother and her entire family um, were forcibly removed from the Seattle area when she was just a young girl, about nine years old. Um, and they were uh, put in a concentration camp, first in the Puyallup Fairgrounds of Western Washington, south of Seattle, and then um, in, in Idaho. Um, at the Minidoka WRA uh, Center. Um, 
my father's family was forcibly excluded. They were able to escape the forced removal to uh, con concentration camps um, by leaving voluntarily in a very short window that was provided for uh, voluntary departure from the West Coast. And he lived um, in a very impoverished existence in, in um, Wyoming for the duration of the war. Um, and my East Coast family in upstate New York were actually massacred by a World War I veteran, uh, a white veteran who um, entered their home on Christmas Eve in 1943 and um, opened fire on them because he wanted to solve the Japanese problem. Um, so as a child in the suburbs of South Seattle near SeaTac Airport, I grew up in the sequelae to uh, World War II and at that time, I remember my parents and my family, extended family talking about the camps. And, um, and I didn't really understand as a young person what that was, but as I grew older, I came to understand um, racism. The racism where people spray paint and kill the Japs uh, on the sidewalk in front of our house where they shot our windows where they would call my mother, after, they would wait until my father left for work and then they would call my mother and say, Jap bitch, we're gonna come kill you now because we know he left for work. And um, so when you're a goldfish growing up in a bowl, you don't realize your confinement or the toxic environment that you are swimming in. But it, and it took me many years to understand the effects of that childhood um, and the anti-Japanese sentiment that still existed in Seattle, even after World War II. As I became older, I, I got very interested in, in trying to understand what the trauma was, I didn't have that word then, affecting my family and, and also how to, to heal, how to heal the community and my family and really what I didn't understand was myself from the transgenerational trauma. And so I, I got very involved with the redress and reparations movement of the Japanese American community. We are the only community other than white slaveholders to receive reparations from the um, US government. Um, and um, so, as a reparations uh, activist in college, I then joined um, the New York Day of Remembrance Committee in New York City when I moved here to go to school. And I've been here now for 30 plus years. Um, and it was there that I met Yuri Kochiyama, uh, Michi Weglin. These are two well-known Japanese American community leaders. Some of you may have heard of, in particular of Yuri because of her friendship and alliance with um, with the radical uh, liberation movement for African heritage people and her friendship with Malcolm X. Um, and she really uh, welcomed me and mentored me as she did with so many young folks here in New York City. And um, eventually I uh, became one of the co-chairs of the New York Day of Remembrance Committee. Um, and it was really through that work that I started becoming involved in really the issues around um, remembrance and trying to make meaningful the experience of the Japanese American community in the modern day. So um, I got involved with the Tule Lake pilgrimage, helping to facilitate um, multi-generational conversations there about, about the experience and the trauma, um, centering the voices of our concentration camp survivors. And it was, it was at the Tule Lake pilgrimage that the group that I co-founded called Sudu for Solidarity um, really had one of its sort of uh, inception moments where we staged um, a demonstration against the zero tolerance policy and the family separation policy of the Trump administration in the summer of 2018, when they were cruelly stripping children out of the arms of their parents at the border deporting the parents and keeping the children locked in cages um, in US detention sites. It was really there that um, a movement started 
called Sudu for Solidarity. And we've been here for about three years now. And um, we're deeply involved in a, a national fight to close detention sites, to stop the US government from um, locking children and families in cages. Um, and our work has really spread beyond just detention and anti-deportation. It's really trying to understand the intersectional um, histories of communities of color that have been sort of targeted by um, the policies of, of white supremacy. And um, that includes forced removals, mass incarcerations, uh, separation of families, deportations, really a, a very intimate relationship with the carceral system of the United States, and of course, de facto violence. And that intersectional history really connotes uh, a really largely undiscussed transgenerational trauma that really is affecting all of our communities. Um, and that, that violence is ongoing. Um, today. And so part of our work is not only to oppose it, to end it, but also to try to um, effect solutions going forward for transforming the trauma so that actually um, we can embrace what Ta Ta-Nehisi Coates has referred to in the reparations movement of this moment of a spiritual repair um, of America. Um, really, there's a, a polarization, a culture war, going on in this country and there's a reckoning that's trying to happen and i'm really pleased to be part of um, a movement that's trying to address that and find new ways for what dr king called the beloved community to repair itself and and come together um, so i'll stop there and i'll hand it back to hannah thank you so much mike so our second panelist is Chizu Omori, and Chizu was born in 1930 and incarcerated as an adolescent at Post in Arizona for over three years during World War II. While studying at UC Berkeley, she became a civil rights activist. In Seattle, she worked for 10 years on the redress campaign and was also a named plaintiff in the class action lawsuit for redress for Japanese Americans. This case was heard before the US Supreme Court and was declared moot after Congress passed the Civil Liberties Act in 1988. She co-produced the documentary Rabbit in the Moon, which discussed Japanese American incarceration and premiered on national TV in 1999. She is currently active in the Thule Lake Committee, Sudu for Solidarity and Wakasa Memorial Com Committee. She has been a columnist and writer for the Nichi Bay Times and other publications for over 30 years. So Chizu, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hi, can you hear me and see me? Okay, yeah. Well, first of all, um, I should tell you that I'm 91 years old. So I'm really a pretty old lady and you'll have to excuse. <laughs> Sometimes I have memory lapses and whatnot, but um, Thank you so much for inviting me to be a participant in this program that you are having. Um, since I've lived such a long time, I've observed a lot. Um, I uh, grew up on a farm in Southern California. Um, and it really was like the Japanese American farmers there had a little sort of like a village, you might say. And so um, we had quite a, a Japanese culture along with uh, an American culture, you might say. So um, I, I, I must say, uh, I'm sure it's hard for you folks to imagine what it was like in the 1930s. Uh, this was in Southern California. Now, um, of course, you know, I understood that we were Japanese, but we were also Americans since we lived in America. So when the war happened, uh, I personally, um, I did not identify with the Japanese at all uh, at that point. But um, of course, we were taken and put into these camps. Now, um, I was 12 years old, so I wasn't 
And being a country kid, you know, um, I really couldn't understand the, the bigger picture, the overall, you know, what had happened to our community. And it really, uh, I had to look back as an adult on all that to really begin to understand what had happened to us. <clears throat> anyway, um, one thing that happened while we were in the camps is that my parents decided that they did not want to stay in the United States anymore. They had been treated so badly and um, they just felt there was no future for us in this country. So they signed repatriation papers and uh, that meant that uh, you know they wanted our family to return to Japan. Uh, I very um, vehemently disagreed with them. I didn't want to, to go to a country I had never been to or anything. And so we did have a major family conflict over this. And I think that this is kind of a, um, you know, standard thing with many families that had these conflicts of identity and like, you know, uh, who are we really, you know, to have been treated in this manner? So, um, well, we did not go to Japan. And um, after coming out of the camps, uh, and then I went to Berkeley, I, I have to say that Berkeley was the greatest influence in my life. Um, great school, a lot going on, and a lot of student politics and stuff going on at that time. So that's where I got a pretty good political education and became kind of a progressive left winger. And um, so it was in the era of red baiting and McCarthy and all that. So, um, and I was part of that Nisei generation that kind of decided to forget the camps that it was just part of the past and uh, we needed to get on with our lives. And so I really didn't think about the camp experience for a long time. Um, but, you know, in, in um, the political activities, I was active in civil rights and we had um, all, uh, we had the anti-Vietnam uh, situation. We had, uh, well, a lot of change, you know, feminism and, and particularly civil rights in the 60s. So those are all the uh, things that went on that influenced me in terms of um, activism, that uh, particularly civil rights. Uh, last night I saw a program on Fannie Lou Hamer. And I remember meeting Fannie Lou Hamer when she came out to the Bay Area and so, uh, it really struck a lot of chords for me in my memory. And there was a real leader. I mean, she was dynamic anyway. Um, so um, I got back interested in our camp history when the redress movement started. And I was in Seattle. And I also became a named plaintiff in the class action suit. And I think that was also a kind of turning point in my life where I met wonderful leaders like Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig and her husband, Jack, and the lawyer, Peter Irons, and, and a lot of lawyers. And at that point, there were many, um, issues that were being addressed. Uh, one was uh, reparations and one was um, the class action lawsuit, uh, naming all the violations of the constitution and the bill of rights and such. Uh, and thirdly, there was the um, movement, the quorum nobis movement to look into and overturn uh, the three court cases that took place during our incarceration that went to the Supreme Court. You may have heard of Hirabayashi, Korematsu, and Yasui, and Mitsue Endo. Those are the court cases. So um, it was a very exciting time because it was like re 
discovering the past and you know what made us who we are um, and it, it was terrific because for me it was like an education and I learned so much um, so that led to my sister who is a filmmaker Emiko Omori um, are making the documentary called Rabbit in the Moon. And that took us about 10 years <laughs> anyway. Um, but, you know, as I learned more about our own history, it certainly made it obvious to me that our story was not so different from the story of other non-whites in this country. And it just made me understand that in spite of all of our highfalutin uh, ideals and whatnot, that this really basically was a racist country and had been from the very beginning. So, um, and, and also my understanding that change has to come about politically and politically means organizing and protesting and you know, fighting for certain legislation and stuff like that. So anyway, um, well, so here I am, I'm still active. And I just wanna show you a poster of like the kinds of things that I do. And um, I don't know if you can read this or not, but it says, yellow power and it has the tutu for solidarity sign here and then for black lives matter so i've marched in all kinds of um all kinds of um, protest marches and whatnot and um seeing how i'm one of the survivors of the camps you know there aren't very many of us left so i'm asked to speak about my experiences so i, I do a lot of that and so um, that's more or less <laughs> my story. I turn it back to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Chizu. And is she not about like the coolest person you've ever met? Um, so uh, our third speaker is uh, Christina Heatherton. And Christina is a assistant professor of American studies and human rights at Trinity College. Her book, Arise, Global Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution will be out later this year on uh, with the University of California Press. Very exciting, Christina. She co-edited Policing the Planet, Why the Policing Crisis Led to Black Lives Matter and Freedom Now, Struggles for the Human Rights, Human Right to Housing in LA, and beyond with Jordan T. Camp. She edited Downtown Blues, a Skid Row reader, and she previously founded and co-directed several public facing initiatives, including the Oral History and Activism Project and the Working Group on Racial Capitalism through Columbia University Center for Study of Social Difference. She currently co-directs the Trinity Social Justice in Initiative. Go ahead, Christina. Okay, um, well, first off, uh, thank you so much to um, the organizers, Hannah and Jason, um, and everybody who put today's events together. And uh, it's such an honor to be on this panel uh, with Mike and Chizu. I've, I've already learned so much just uh, being here listening. Um, you know, one of the things I'm particularly appreciative of uh, with this event is, uh, you know, I grew up in uh, the West Coast in Southern California mostly. And there's a lot of different ways that uh, the effect of uh, the Japanese American internment incarceration is marked in the landscape. And um, so coming to New England and realizing how, uh, you know, there's a very keen absence. And so um, I never underestimate what it means to uh, take seriously the day of remembrance. Uh, you know, just to merely establish the fact, you know, that this happened, and then to think, um, as we're doing today, about what it means. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that I can start, but I, I think I'll just say a little bit about how some of this history is marked in the landscape, particularly uh, in Little Tokyo, which is one of three historic, uh, you know, uh, 
areas in California um, uh, for Japanese Americans, this is a place that um, has been really foundational to me, my family and my own development. Allegedly, one half of my family opened um, a Buddhist temple in one part of the community and the other part of the family opened up the gambling den. So that's sort of me in a nutshell. Um, my grandfather uh, was a pommel horse champion at Roosevelt High School in Boyle Heights and spent a lot of time in Little Tokyo. Um, there used to be a trolley that went through the city that my mother and uh, her relatives had to take uh, to come down to Little Tokyo. Um, my uh, my great grandfather, their grandfather was an Okinawan gardener and he would spend a lot of time at those bars. And uh, so the way they would figure out uh, how he was doing is if he was speaking uh, Japanese, he was sober. If he was speaking Spanish, which he could also speak, that meant he was a little tipsy. But if he was speaking English, that meant that they had to bring him home immediately. Um, my aunt was a, a, a member of the Nisei Week Court in 1965 during the Watts Uprising. And uh, not too long ago, my sister was also a part of the court. She was Nisei Week Queen. So, um, you know, all this to say, I've got a lot of deep history in the area. I've been around a lot of different housing uh, organizers, cultural organizers in the area. Um, my sister, who was a Nisei Week Queen, also worked for the Japanese American National Museum. And I guess that's kind of where I want to, uh, you know, <laughs> this is where I want to take these uh, New England audience. Um, Inside the, the museum, uh, the Japanese American National Museum, there is a um, there are some barracks uh, from one of the camps, um, and this took on some new meaning for me while I was working and organizing in downtown Los Angeles. Little Tokyo is right next to an area called Skid Row, which is uh, probably still has the highest concentration of poverty in the whole country. Um, and for a while, while I was working there, it also had the highest concentration of policing resources uh, uh, anywhere in the world outside of Baghdad, according to one UCLA of Law report. Um, and so there was always a world of meaning that I was having to translate coming from work, coming from organizing meetings in Skid Row and crossing over into Little Tokyo to see family, to see friends, to do other kinds of work. And I always had to think about what the meaning of that barracks meant uh, in, in that museum when, you know, f from just blocks away, there was this super high concentration of policing resources, which meant there was an extraordinary uh, high number of um, uh, arrests, warrants, and, and frankly, disappearances from the mostly Black community, Black and immigrant community that lived uh, just outside of Little Tokyo. So I mention this because I think part of the way that I've come to a lot of my work has always been trying to square something like that. How do we think about our history in this, um, you know, amidst the rise of the carceral state? How do we think about uh, Japanese American history, the history of the Japanese American incarceration, um, you know, in an era of mass incarceration? Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll just reiterate, I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of this event today where we're thinking through exactly those questions. But there's no way that that history is removed from these questions or this world. And it's on all of us to try to figure out how to make that connection meaningful. Thank, thank you so much, Christina. Oh, wait, come back. Um, so I'd love to have all three of our panelists come back on screen. And we're just going to have a little bit of a dialogue um, amongst us. Um, so I'm going to change it to a gallery view. Um, but uh, before I get too far, I've been meaning to tell you all this entire time and completely forgot several times um, to mention that you can ask questions and we will be moving to an audience Q&A toward um, in the next like few minutes, probably 10 minutes or so. Um, so please add your questions into the chat and into the Q&A function, either one works, um, and I will start adding them in as we get them. Um, so. Uh, the first question that I have for the three of you, and you know, just if something strikes your fancy, speak up. It doesn't need to be in a particular order. Um, what does the historical context of the incarceration, because I think all three of you really rely on that history in your own families and in Chizu's case, her own personal history to um, kind of inspire your Japanese American activism. So how does that, what does that lend to your activism? Uh, 
All right, I'll jump in real quick and then please, please others jump in too. Um, you know, in the work that I'm doing, and I think I think that that uh, Chisu and Christina are also doing, there's a context here for us, which is that, um, you know, when they removed our community, they had surveilled us for 10 years. They knew where we lived. Um, and so that's how they could round us up so quickly. Uh, that's part of a pattern of the carceral system of the United States. And um, when you look at the Japanese American confinement sites historically run by the War Relocation Authority under Dylan Myers or the Department of Justice, what you see is a network of incarceration sites um, that were based um, on existing models, you know, um, really around, you know, Myers ran the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so the things that he understood about how to forcibly remove um, communities and incarcerate them, he basically used on our community. And then the lessons that he learned about how to be more efficient about that, including how to disperse a community after the war and assimilate them and destroy them, basically, um, cultural genocide. Um, he then took those lessons and took them back to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so you can see the interconnectedness, right, of, of how this oppression has worked across communities. I mean, Hannah knows this um, because of the work around Native American studies and that our incarceration sites, some of them were on Native reservation lands, right, who resisted having our people incarcerated there. So, you know, like there's this, there's this interconnectedness. There's more to it too. There's that... There were people who resisted from like uh, Tule Lake and Manzanar concentration camps, they resisted. And there's a myth that we didn't resist, that we went sort of quietly. That is not true. Our people fought this and, um, and they were punished severely for doing it, including removing leaders of the resistance and putting them in secret confinement sites called the Loop Center um, in the Southwest. And those sites become the precursors to a site like Guantanamo, where they have a secret sites that, that is extrajudicial. It's outside of the legal system of the United States, so they can do things to people there that are illegal, basically, according to international human rights standards. That precedent starts with the Japanese American community. That site, Guantanamo, is then used to develop a modern prison industrial complex system for immigrants. And it's primarily used on Haitians. And now what we see is a model of mass incarceration and criminal, what we call crimigration, right? Criminalizing immigrants who are really asserting their human rights to migrate. Um, and confining them in a carceral system that you know is the largest detention system in the world at this point and so um that's how we see the context at least how i see the context of, of the japanese american sort of narrative within all of this sort of historical narrative of white supremacy policies in the united states well, Mike, I mean, you have really studied this history. And I must say, you know, that the more we learn about what happened to us, Japanese Americans, uh, the worse it gets. I mean, after all these years, we're still digging up information that, you know, just makes it seem like, uh, boy, they really did a number on our whole community, the way they separated us and, um, you know, like loyals and disloyals and no-nos and blah, blah, all that stuff. Um, so that, um, well, our government, oh, I, they also had a huge system of informers within the camps. I mean, that's, you know, really disheartening to learn about, but it's true that there were paid, people were paid to spy on one another in the camps. And, uh, you know, I mean, just made me feel pretty terrible to find out these things 
but this is just within the human experience and the government obviously was pretty skillful in um, setting up systems of this type. So, um, you know, there's always informers, isn't there? Look at the black movement and all of, all of the movements, I guess, I think that they have in, infiltrators and such. So are we so free and are, are we so, you know, um, should I say, yeah, we're being surveilled upon all the time, I guess. Anyway. Um, I, I'll just add briefly, I, I thought Chizu and Mike did an extraordinary job really showing, you know, like what's the, what the meaning of the history is, you know, how it's steeped in all these other forms of racist control and how it helps reproduce all these other forms of racist control. Um, you know, I couldn't have said it better, Mike, particularly, how do we think about the long history of settler colonialism and Indian removal? Um, as being the blueprint for what we're talking about today with Japanese American incarceration. Um, I, I think that some of my interests are also around the fact that, you know, what, um, I, I guess this question that uh, Chizu uh, just underscored at the end, this question of surveillance uh, and, and what we make of that um, and which communities were surveilled, right? Which communities were affected by this? You know, I mean, it wasn't singularly Japanese Americans who were affected as we might understand them now. You know, there were members of my family that were black and because they were black, they were not interned with the rest of their families and got lost in different systems as a result. Um, my book uh, actually starts from having, from talking to some of my relatives about the internment, about the incarceration, about the removal. Um, uh, one of my great uncles, um, a lot of my family is Okinawan. They came uh, through Mexico into um, Southern California, uh, the Imperial Valley. And I was talking to one of them about what the original roundup felt like. And just like Mike said at the beginning, you know, these communities were surveilled long before they were ever removed. And, uh, you know, the cause of that surveillance was organizing. So my great uncle was a labor organizer in the Imperial Valley. That meant he was an organizer with South Asian, with black, with Mexican workers. He could speak a number of languages. And so, um, and on top of that, as I've told Jason before, you know, he had been uh, to Mexico and that's how he had learned Spanish. And so when um, federal agents came to pick him up, he, you know, he didn't know what it was for. And so, you know, he tells this great story. His son tells me this great story about how he was, you know, he just saw a federal agent coming and he said, because he had been down there with Pancho Villa, he knew how to take care of business. And he was going to like, you know, um, he was going to take care of business. But I thought this was such an extraordinary story for helping us understand, you know, also the different types of movements that were being that were coordinated that were being that were being thought together and that were being surveilled right so it wasn't just uh, like movements within the community for its own sake there was also a tremendous amount of labor organizing that was happening with other communities there was also great affiliation with other revolutionary movies in the in the early 20th century so when we think about the surveillance over those uh, communities that initiated this you know that the incarceration of japanese americans helped to stop we have to understand that that was also very capacious and hopefully that can help engender a capaciousness in the way we think about our organizing today. Oh, that's such a lovely point, Christina. And it is a perfect segue into my next question for you, which is more about how we find joy and strength in our communities and um, specifically in pilgrimage, um, which I think many Japanese Americans participate in returns to the sites of their families' incarcerations. I've been to Gila River and Heart Mountain, as well as Poston, which my family was not at. Um, but I've always found those moments just extremely heartrending and um, invigorating for the work that we do. And so I want to ask you all about the, sig the significance of return to those sites of pilgrimage. Um, for you. I guess we'll keep our speaking order here. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I have not yet been to back to Minidoka, which is where my family was incarcerated. Um, I was planning to go in, in 2020, but the pandemic, you know, uh, derailed those plans. But I have been a volunteer with the Tule Lake Pilgrimage, and I think I've been to the last four of those. 
Um, and I really consider that my community really Sudu for solidarity really finds its roots in the Tulian community, um, which is the community in the Japanese American narrative that most vocally resisted and were punished for speaking up and having their voice of dissent. And so the, the, in regards to pilgrimage, the word that I, I really ponder and think about and meditate on recently is regeneration. And um, the first time I went to the Tule Lake pilgrimage, I became ill. I, I literally vomited. Um, because there's a there's a memorial ceremony right next to the pit where they where the county um, removed and dug out the remains of our people out of a cemetery to use their remains to pave roads for an airport right there. So our people were desecrated there and and just collectively holding space there together just opened up a vein of sorrow and grief that I had no idea was contained within me. And it was, it was like coming out so strongly, I became violently ill. Um, but I was just listening today to uh, an audible book by um, the famous Buddhist abbess uh, Pema Chodron, um, When Things Fall Apart. And in the opening, chapter of her book, which I was revisiting after 20 years, she talks about facing fear. And in facing fear, you're facing annihilation. And really, it's in facing that emotional trauma that we find the seeds of rebirth within ourselves and within community and within families and within um, potential relationships with people we haven't even met yet. And so um, I think the pilgrimages really embody the spirit of that. And I think that's why they become so important um, for the Japanese American community, in particular um, across generations. But I watch, um, you know, I'm a Yonsei fourth generation, but I'm watching younger Yonseis or Goseis fifth generations who come to these pilgrimages. And it's very life-changing for them to find this historical connection to maybe their grandparents or great-grandparents who they might not even have known, but to find, um, to find a piece of yourself in that place, in that site, in the relationships and, and experiences that are held there in that land is so important. And um, if there's folks here who are of Japanese American heritage who have not had the chance to attend a pilgrimage, I really encourage you to join the Tadaima um, pr uh, project that is now virtual, but who host um, um, pilgrimages and help support that. Um, that, that sort of uh, group of, of projects um, when, when possible in person, because I, I think it's an important life-changing experience. Well, I'll speak up here. Um, I have not, you know, like made it a, my bucket list thing, like going to all of the sites and all that, but I have been to some. And the most recent one I visited was uh, Topaz. Uh, Delta is the little town close to Topaz, and um, I'm part of the Wakasa Memorial Committee, and it's, oh, I won't go into too much detail because it's pretty complicated, but we were there. Um, it has to do with a murder that took place during the camp years, 1943, where a man named James Wakasa, who was shot by a sentry and uh, that uh, death was covered up. And when the, the uh, community itself wanted to have a, a funeral for him at the site where he died, uh, the authorities said no. So they held a funeral you know, in some other place, but uh, a group of um, old Issei that's the immigrant generation. Um, a month later, erected a monument in his memory, and it was a big rock. And uh, when the authorities 
learned about that, they immediately said, oh no, we can't have a memorial for this. So, um, so that, um, that memorial was ordered destroyed and so it sort of disappeared. And um, it's only lately that the stone has been uh, rediscovered. So <laughs> this is, you know, this is a very interesting story about how um, this uh, event that happened at Topaz has suddenly been rediscovered. And anyway, so we went there and uh, I must say being in that landscape, in that kind of desolate landscape and, and just, I don't know, you, you know, I mean, I'm not a believer in things of the supernatural or something, but anyway, it just, you know, you could feel the spirits there of all, I don't know how 10,000 people or whatever lived in Topaz. And I also, I'm active with Tule Lake. So I go to the Tule Lake pilgrimage and um, it, it uh, well, there's something unique about being on site, it just, you know, floods one or floods me <laughs> with, with kind of like, look what happened to us here sort of thing. And, you know, it's really has affected generations. And I just get the feeling that we need to know this history. It's been hidden for so long. You need to learn it for the sake of the children, really. Sake of the country, really. Um, I, I agree that the pilgrimages, the, particularly the formal pilgrimages that you can um, go on are extraordinarily powerful in, in ways. I appreciate uh, you know, what my co-panelists have shared just about the types of emotion they kick up, you know, the, the things that come out that, you know, I, I think you could spend a long time processing and, and, and trying to understand what they mean. I just wanted to briefly say something about a pilgrimage I took that was an informal one. Um, I went with uh, some family and friends uh, to Manzanar where some of my family had been interned. Um, and uh, what was really fascinating for me was what was in the bookshop. Uh, so this was in about 2005 and um, there were prominently selling copies of Michelle Malkin's book in defense of internment at the bookstore. Uh, and so this was, you know, a couple years after 9-11. I don't encourage anybody to look at this work. The kind of title explains it all, but um, you know, this was someone who identifies as an Asian American conservative who was defending the internment and also promoting it uh, for um, Muslims, um, Muslim Americans and Muslims full stop. Uh, and I, um, uh, there's a longer story. If we weren't just about at the end, I'd tell about what happened with me and the volunteer who was running that stop, uh, that shop. But, you know, I, I bring this up in terms of a pilgrimage, because I think the story underscores what it means to think about our history at this moment. There continues to be a very far right assault, uh, on institutions of history and what the meanings of things like the Japanese American incarceration internment mean. Um, particularly with people saying that it was a success and it was something that we should replicate at its most odious. Um, but I also think uh, I've been really impressed in talking to my co-panelists uh, here and you know, as we prepared for this and just understanding what it means to think about this an event that is unfinished. I think part of the reason that it's uh, motivated, um, the way we remember this is to continue fighting is because we do not think that this has been resolved. We do not think that because there was redress that somehow this is over. And we do, we, we refuse to be conscripted into the surveillance, incarceration, or the military destruction of any other community done in our name. And so, you know, there's important ways that we have to think about this history because increasingly it's Asian Americans that are being conscripted into the expansion of military and carceral states. And if we consign ourselves to a liberal version of history that says this is over and done with and resolved and fully redressed, we participate in that violence. And so, you know, I think a fitting type of remembrance is to say as a community, we refuse. Oh, I can't even, uh, chills, Christina. That was so well put. Um, and I think that's exactly what I was hoping 
for us to get out of this. I think what you said about remembrance and that activism is in itself maybe a form of remembrance for us and a refusal to see this moment as closed um, is just so powerful. Um, we have run out of time, unfortunately. I wish we could keep chatting all day, um, but I, um, I encourage you all to uh, keep in touch and um, to follow all of these organizations on Twitter and um, Christina is also on Twitter. So please just uh, keep up and keep informed about the work that th these organizations are doing and that Christina is doing at Trinity. So thank you so much um, and we'll call it a day. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Sorry, I have the book.